Welcome to the DenFest speaker series. Um, this is our first talk for the day, so pretty excited to um, kick things off with this group with me. I've got Angela Ferguson from Future Space, got designer Adam Goodrum, architect Brad Ray from Branch Studio Architects, and Alex Hopkins from Studio Tate. Um, now, uh, I'm, I should explain who I am. I'm the editor of DenFair. My name's Sandra. Um, so before I joined the DenFair team uh, in January this year, I'd spent some time freelancing and working from home. And I think we're seeing this more and more in the creative industries. So today, um, this panel um, of experts here um, bring their diverse expertise to this topic. Um, and we're going to find out all about how uh, working from home is now changing the dynamic of the way we work and live. Um, so if we could all give them a warm welcome. Take it away. Thanks, Sandra. Um, so some of you might have been at the talk yesterday when we were talking about the workplace and what's happening in workplace design and others might be aware that uh, for a few years now the workplace has become a lot more domestic in terms of not only the aesthetic but also its level of formality and amenity. So we're seeing workplaces now that look more like high-end residential interiors with really well-equipped kitchens and catering spaces. Uh, the best workplaces today really include a lot of opportunities for us to socialise with our work families and our work wives and our work husbands. And workplaces are providing really contemplative spaces that uh, people are able to use like they use their homes. And so what we want to talk about today though is the opposite of that and how residential design is being informed by the workplace we are going to explore what sorts of productive, engaging spaces are being designed at home for work. And we also probably want to touch on whether this is actually a good thing or not, this blurring of boundaries between work and home. So my own home slash work situation is that I run a business that has two CBD studios. I work at home probably one or two days a week and one day on the weekend. And uh, my home setup is pretty much a mirror of what I've got in the office in terms of ergonomics and uh, technology and connection and natural light. Um, everyone here on this panel has their own unique homework situation. So what I might do is get um, Adam, Brad and then Alex each to just explain their own sort of homework scenario and, and what their focus is, whether it's product, residential, interiors, architecture. Hello. Um, up until recently, I used to live above my studio, so kind of my work and my studio used to very heavily blend. Um, but they were two, or they still are, two separate residents, so I could still go out the door, um, come back in. It was kind of a change of headspace um, to get in a place that was quiet and away from I've got two children and a dog and all that kind of thing. Um, so that worked very well, but recently we've just moved to another place and um, I don't really have a home office, home office there at all. And I guess like a lot of people, it's mainly just um, an open plan living. So there's not really a designated area where you can go to get away from the noise and that kind of thing. Um, so the main room is where it all really happens. So trying to do homework, my wife also has her own business. So this one room kind of has to function for all these different things. And, you know, the kitchen table, for me, if I'm trying to do a drawing or something, um, will be a workspace. My son, if he's trying to do his homework, will be a workspace. And then all of a sudden, you know, that table's got to cater for dinner and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a challenge, I guess. Sounds like there's a lot going on at your there's place. Lot, yeah. Yep. Busy family. Yeah. Like everyone. Brad? Um, <clears throat> so we, um, we started our practice branch studio architects um, in 2012, so it's been had our practice for about seven years. And um, in the founding days, um, we actually used to work out of a little apple orchard um, about an hour away from Melbourne. My business partner lives in Kilcunda, um, which is down near Phillip Island. So we used to commute an hour each way to meet. Um, and it was very, it was beautiful. It was tranquil, amazing, kangaroos everywhere. Um, so completely separated um, from the home. Um, and then two years ago, we moved to Nightingale One um, in Brunswick, and we also have our studio there. Um, so it's been lovely. We've got um, we've since had two kids, 
um, life's very different now um, to when we were starting our practice and um, you know we could spend the time I suppose away f- away from uh, where we live um, but now it's you know important to be closer closer to home so um, having the flexibility of having my family you know two or three levels above me is wonderful um, and also just having a, a I guess a form of separation between work and life um, which is important so um, uh, hi, I'm Alex from Studio Tate. We are an interior architecture practice um, and a little younger than Brunt, we're five years old. Um, my own home work setting is I have a separate study space um, and up until recently I actually wasn't really using that all that often. I was typically going into the office to do my work even if you know, we did have to do something late at night or on the weekend and I think that was because our studio when we started the practice was 10 minutes from home. We were subletting some space in Armidale and I live in Malvern. Um, 12 months ago though, uh, we secured a space in Richmond right near Burnley Station. So all of a sudden my commute, not long, I mean it's only 20 or 30 minutes depending on traffic, but it was that little bit further. So um, the appeal of popping into the office to do a bit here and there became less so and so I was I've been encouraged I suppose to do some work at home Um, and even we had a teleconference last week just to catch up ahead of today and uh, I was doing that from home so my study space is um, a separate room no physical door Uh, it is open to sort of circulation space in our home but similar to you Angela I've got um, second you know dual screen task lighting an ergonomic chair and a lovely big window for natural light. So, um, so what's working well about these situations and what's not working so well? Brad, do you want to kick off? Yeah, sure. So I think the, the best part is, I've, well, th- there's a number of things I suppose. I've lowered my carbon footprint um, by being so close to, to home, um, which is a good thing. Um, but I suppose, you know, I get to the point now where after a couple of weeks of being in the office, because I work and live in the same place, Florence Street is kind of this mecca where everything happens. There's fruit markets and all sorts of things. You don't even have to leave um, most of the time. So it's got to the point now where I actually have to tell myself I need to get out of here for you know a day or something and just clear my mind a little bit and get back to that you know that original space that we had in the middle of the apple orchard, which was you know a really quite a reflective space. Um, so that I mean there's there's obviously good and bad things about um, about. Uh, the situation but I think for me personally now having two little kids as well I you know I get the flexibility of seeing the kids every day even the point of view I was talking to my wife about this last night of them having just walked past the window and being able to wave through the window without that kind of you know tactile you know of course you want to give them a hug but at the same time too you know sometimes you, you're in the zone you're working um, it's just nice to have be, to give them a wave and you know see them off so um, I think having that physical bar- that, that that slight physical barrier between um, where you work as well as, and, and, and that kind of um, circulation space is, is definitely an important thing. So is there anything good about your situation, Adam? Um, <laughs> it's near the beach, the new one, so that's a highlight. Um, to be honest, I think when I lived upstairs, I found myself during the weekend constantly going down there, so I didn't really have a lot of separation. And now that Um, I live about 20 minutes away, yeah, it's nice to, I think, on the weekends I'm finding myself not working as much and spending more time with the children, which is obviously a good thing. Um, But definitely in our new place, it's quite hectic uh, with sort of so much noise and all that sort of thing. But I think it's kind of just the way it is. Like, we're sort of so adaptable. You know, I was having breakfast this morning in a relatively noisy cafe and there's someone working on their computer beside me and she's on like a very rigid stool and there's so much noise and she was so focused. You know, I think um, we're just so used to it now to work in these environments, whether it's home or in a more public environment and that kind of thing. And because of smart devices as well, like smart devices are just amazing, you know, it's kind of just, you can be so, so much productivity because it's always there. Whether or not that's a good thing, I don't know. And Alex, you were talking um, when we caught up the other week about some clients that you work with and how you've designed spaces for them that incorporate their home office into really the big living space. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, Yes. um, There's a few of our visuals. I'm hoping the right one will come up in a minute. But uh, yes, we 
um, I suppose when thinking about working from home, it can be professionals like all of us who might have businesses or are doing some work for the business that you're working with at home. Um, but we, and we have clients in that instance, um, but we also find a lot of our private residential clients have got uh, children, adolescent children, who are doing some pretty serious study at home. Um, you know, it's very competitive, I guess, high school these days and getting a certain score to get into the course that you want to do. Um, so, you know, the students, uh, the kids are really having to focus and, and get that work done in a really concentrated way. Um, so we go through a really thorough briefing process with all of our clients, um, whether it's a commercial client or a private resi client. Um, and really to get to understand their functional requirements. So um, ah, that project on the screen is the one I was keen to touch on. That's a private residential job that we just finished recently in um, uh, Armidale of Melbourne. So that particular client, they've got three kids, uh, one who's just finished year 12 and the two kids are younger than that again. Uh, Nick has his own um, ophthalmology practice. He works three days remotely in Wangaratta. Um, Sue runs the household with three kids. You can imagine that's quite busy. And then, as I said, Sophie's just finished uh, year 12. Because Nick is out of town a lot, often it's just Sue and the three kids at home. Um, and because the kids are at different ages, the work that Nettie's doing is generally out in the sort of public domain of the home, similar, I guess, to you, Adam, in that it, you're still wanting to keep an eye on what, what Nettie's doing. So that particular table element, that's a couple of metres long there, we can see the stools, and then there's the stone bench top with the lovely styled floral arrangement, which is not normally there when the family's actually living, but um, that's their island bench with integrated, uh, an integrated meals and dining zone. That was something that we came up with for, in particular for this client because part of the way that they live um, day to day is that, as I said, Nick is away and Sue and the three kids are dining together and they wanted a more intimate setting, but also they actually wanted a work zone. So that table element has got power and ability to plug in underneath. Um, and we saw it actually in action when we were photographing the project. Sophie was there, had all the um, uni applications spread out across the table and um, then that got cleared away and then take away from, um, I think it was Hanoi Hannah, came in the night that we were finishing up from doing the photo shoot. So it was wonderful to see that actually what we had designed was working really well for that family. And that particular model we've adapted a few, in a few different ways for private resi clients. And so do you think this is, uh, is there any prevailing trend in terms of um, preference for having the workspace incorporated into the open areas or is there, um, are you designing separate spaces as well, sort of, you know, Brady Bunch style dens or are we seeing any of that? I'll jump in quickly. Um, we have done a bit of both. So we've got some uh, residential settings where we've got like a rumpus area um, but with a big long bench and the kids are working together on the rumpus bench. We've just got a project that's starting on site at the moment where the, the girls have actually got their own desks in their rooms. But um, th in that instance, the girls are a little older. So I think from that point of view, you don't necessarily have to be watching what the kids are doing in terms of security. I think it does depend on um, the age of the children. Um, and then I think, as we discussed last week, if you are working you know as an adult running a practice sometimes it is good to have a separate study space where you can actually close the door and we're certainly providing that one of our other projects which is str scrolling through one of our clients is an author and it was really important for her that we des designed a really tranquil space she doesn't have an office that she goes into she does all of her writing from home um, so that was a lovely setting designed as a mini workspace effectively but with a door in a separate zone in the house to the sort of active living spaces because she really does require lots of quiet time. Yeah, no, I was just, <clears throat> just going to follow on a little bit, I suppose, about the den, the idea of the den. I think that's something that's kind of come up in a few of our residential projects over the last sort of three to four years. Um, and even in eating into the, the kind of um, the educational projects that we do as well. Um, but but actually thinking about, it's really funny, Os Oscar e Niemeyer designed um, a series of uh, portable schools um, in the 50s and the 60s in, in Brazil and um, basically completely open plan um, this, the, the classrooms were sort of disconnected by well connected and disconnected by um, lo sort of mid-height level walls um, and that's something that we always kind of look at too in terms of the, the idea of the den so it's a space within a space um, that sort of um, it creates a bit of a, um, 
a space where you can kind of tie up and, 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 and I suppose hug you, I suppose. And it's about, um, for us, thinking about architectural space and that as well, thinking about the section, thinking about um, a space that which comes down um, to, to re I suppose, receive you, if, you if, if, if that makes sense, a, a space that um, essentially hugs you. Um, where you can go into and, and kind of... It's like um, when we think about something like a, a, a library, um, thinking about the diversity of space in terms of, you know, some people like to be out in the open, so some people like to be sitting out at, at an open workstation and then other people like to curl themselves up in a, you know, a bit of a, a nest. Yeah. So, you know, if we think of the den as a space like that. So you're talking really about diversity and choice and giving people flexibility to make it work for yeah, them at a home. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we, we, we often talk about that idea um, as kind of a narrative um, in, in a lot of our work um, and we, we often refer to it as curated flexibility in that, you know, if you give someone too much flexibility, they don't know what to do with it. Often, you know, particularly with like large, larger yeah, schools and things, a lot of those, those messages and a lot of the, the ambitions that you're trying to set out just get lost. Um, you often find that you know chairs and things are often facing the wrong way from the views and all those types of things. Um, so it's just about creating enough flexibility, but then curating at the same time that those things aren't lost. So Adam, as a furniture designer and product designer, what are you um, seeing influencing what you're doing from that sort of work home blurred lifestyle? Yeah, I don't, I don't know from what I'm seeing. In some ways, this talk I was interested to kind of learn, to be honest. Because I probably, um, it's not like I've ever designed a home office desk or anything like that. Um, but I think for me, in moving forward with different typologies, I think one thing that I would very much like to address would be storage. I know at home, our dining table, when Ollie, my little boy, stuffs all over the table and we're about to have some dinner, you know, if there was a drawer that I could pull out and we could get everything away, it would be very useful. Um, I think particularly with phones, we seem to all be trying to grab the charger, so to incorporate induction charging um, is important. Um, and then the other one, which is the bigger one, I think the acoustics and the noise, that's a really challenging one, which I don't really um, have an answer for that unless it's potentially a, another designated room. But I did actually, I got, well, Colt got a lovely brief from Angela's firm, Future Space, um, when they were working on PwC to design um, some pieces with a real attention to acoustics. And there's a piece that comes up which is called Bower, which um, has this, uh, it's this PET, recycled PET, and it you know, absorbs noise. And this was for a very commercial project in which we have these high back sofas and that kind of thing, but we also designed a desk pod. And it was specifically designed for a commercial application, um, but I know it's been sold residentially for um, children's desks and that kind of thing. So I guess in some ways that's sort of addressing the acoustic issue. Um, I think the other thing on that though too is the ergonomics of it because yeah. domestic furniture has a different ergonomic focus than commercial furniture. So do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, well, <clears throat> both my boys, they both have um, a desk in their room and the idea was that they would be using those desks, but uh, the desk just seems to accumulate a whole lot of crap and they never seem to do much work there. And I'm a bit of a chair collector, so I have all these chairs, so at least I was able to get one of my chairs on those desks, but they're not very acoustic, sorry, they're not very ergonomic. But I, uh, we have um, this little, I've only, we've been in this new place for so many months, so it's very new, but on our bedroom there's a little sunroom and uh, I'm going to turn that into a more designated uh, office sort of area and I will, yeah, I'll be thinking about a much more ergonomic chair for that space, yeah, but generally, no, they're, you know, they're much more residential. But, sorry, just back, I think it's, you know, people sit in a cafe for two hours in the most uncomfortable chair and it mustn't be good, but we're just so adaptable. Like, yeah, but is, that's not necessarily a good it's thing, right? Good because thing. health know. and well-being is no. a big part of Absolutely. our lives today in yeah. all areas. So, yeah. you know, what can we do about this? <laughs> You're the furniture designer. Well, yeah, I think, I think it's part of, um, I think, being very aware that there's a certain aesthetic which fits in the home, but being, con you know, there is correct ergonomics. There's a human factors ergonomics with particular heights and lumbar support and that kind of thing, and trying to apply those ergonomics to a chair that still has a more friendly sort of residential feel. It's actually interesting. I, I find with a lot of... I keep crossing over because we do a lot of educational work in our practice, but a lot of the, um, the educational projects we do, we often bring 
elements of the home back into those spaces because they work really successfully. Um, so it is thinking about things like day beds and things. We often find, you know, those are the types of things that kids particularly um, are drawn to. So those are the, you know, those kind of soft spaces where they can cuddle up and, you know, lay out a couple of cushions or something like that. Um, are the spaces generally that are kind of more susceptible to um, probably not, you know, um, studying space, but more of a social space, I suppose, and even being able to read and things like that. Um, I think also, Angela, to your point um, earlier, I guess if there's the opportunity within the home and space provides the opportunity to have flexibility, then having a, set, a desk with an ergonomic chair means that if concentrated work is happening, that's where you go. But if perhaps you're doing something for a shorter period of time and you are perhaps in the mood for more of a sitting on the sofa with a cup of tea, and ideally it's not for as long a period of time, then having the right side table to facilitate that or the right sort of table that you could pull up to your lap to help for shorter periods of work. Um, but ultimately, I think you're right, there is that issue of ergonomics, wellbeing and concentrated work. And I, I think we find that even with our workplace projects, um, people are, are sometimes still not even using their task chairs correctly. Um, so we just got um, briefed last week on a particular on a new task chair, um, a Herman Miller one that doesn't have any adjustable functions. I can't remember what the chair it's called. I should know, um, but it's the idea is that if you are going to a sort of co-work space, you're not going to adjust the chair, and that does sort of adapt and mould to you. So perhaps there's an opportunity where some of those you know sophisticated technologies around sort of adaptable ergonomics can come into residential furniture design eventually. Yeah. So is that something you're seeing too, that, that focus of how we design our homes is changing? So, you know, it's less decorative, it's more about performance, it's more about relationships. Are they the sorts of things that you're seeing in, in resi in design? Resi? Yeah. Um, it's funny, we sort of find in our resi portfolio we've got two streams of aesthetic. We've got um, sort of older downsizer couple and then we've got the family style um, home and each of those briefs demands a different aesthetic. Often the older couple who are downsizing want something a little more glamorous um, and then obviously I suppose families want something that is definitely very functional and practical. So um, we obviously try to inject um, some personality and intrigue into all of our projects. Typically family homes are, um, you know, as I said, more of a focus around um, the practical stuff, I guess. Um, but still trying to make sure that our designs are intelligent and in intuitive, I guess. Um, that's, it, whether it's ergonomics, sitting at a desk, or the way that you've designed the kitchen, that's, it's important, we think, um, at every touch point. And then you would have some experience of this working out of Nightingale, I would have thought. Can, can you talk about that a little bit, Brian? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in, I suppose, like, there's a, there's, uh, there's a few contexts. What context would you like me to...? Well, just the context of that, um, you know, the community and the home and the work and how the whole thing is kind of coming together as this... It's a new typology, really, for working and living. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I think, I think the, the public spaces in the building, well, the more, you know, the, the, the shared spaces um, are those spaces where, you know, particularly on nice days, we've got spaces on the rooftop where we can get up and just put a laptop up um, and we have, the guys in the office have done it too on, on good days. You can just go up there and um, work from the rooftop, which is really nice. So it is kind of getting outside and getting exposed to the elements, which is nice, which, which you'd often wouldn't probably get in a scenario like that. Um, and I guess it's also too, it's just the, the nature of, um, I don't know, from, for myself, um, just that proximity, I suppose, um, of, of, of having a, a space close by. So, Adam, do you want to add anything to that? <coughs> I don't know what I've got to add. <laughs> I don't... <coughs> I've just... Um, probably you want to um, talk about your products and stuff, but I have just done a new collection with a company called Tate, and it's literally... It's called Scape, and it's literally trying to address that kind of thing, that it, um, either in residential or commercial, but in an open space, and trying to encourage to get away from maybe the hectic side and... Um, to socialise or to do a little bit of work, but yeah, getting away from your sort of normal space. Yeah, yeah but it's specifically designed for that kind of thing. And it's sort of, you know, I think we're, we're living in such a dense population now, but if you look back 
um, to England and they had the commons where you know, you'd share your garden and be a place to one, grow your veggies, but then also socialise, it's really important that we're creating these outdoor spaces which are one to have a break, but then they also are functional to do work. Yeah, I think, kind of thing. I think even the, the, the kind of level of materiality too with these spaces is really important. Like we've got grass on our roof, you know. Yeah. Even just having that like real patch of grass, not artificial grass, real grass on the roof makes yeah. a huge difference um, to, to a variety of kind of narratives, I suppose, even from, from well-being, you know, that kind of element of just being able to touch something yeah. natural yeah. Um, tactile. and tactile. Um, but it's, in, it's interesting because there's these little nooks and things that, you know, again, cross over into our educational work, but that we find on the rooftop, there's little spaces that you can get out and just get away. Like you can be up there on the rooftop at Nightingale with a whole variety of different people or you can get away and hide yourself off in a little nook. And I think just providing those, um, the flexibility of those spaces and, and, and I guess uh, a broad range of those spaces is really important. It's something we always look towards in our work. Yeah. Um, so I guess thinking about your current situation, the three of you, would you spend more time at, like would you prefer to spend more time currently either at home or at work? I'd definitely like to spend more time at... Well, I guess the beauty of my, my life is that I'm so close to home. So, I, feel, I mean, the work life is, you know, there's a huge parallel and crossover. Um, so, I, I actually couldn't ask for a better scenario, to be honest. I don't actually think there would... I couldn't imagine a, a better possibility than what I've already got. Um, so, I've got nothing so negative to say, really. You win. Yeah, I win. <laughs> Perfect scenario. Perfect scenario. Yeah. Alex? No, uh, um... As I said before, I've only probably just started to do more work from home. I'm a bit of an old soul, not very adaptable, which is not great, is it, for advocating um, contemporary ways of working. But um, I've typically been someone who much prefers to be at my desk in the office. Um, I think that I have, in the last you know, few weeks, few months, seen the benefits of being at home because you can actually get some quiet time separate to your lovely work colleagues but you know if you need to get two hours of phone calls done it's a great way to do that um, so you might decide to stay you know this, this morning I did an, an hour and a half of calls before coming here for example and so um, I think for me to answer the question um, changing my mindset and doing a little bit more from home I think I would find I'd be probably a lot more productive and I'm fortunate that I actually have a space in our home environment where I can actually have the laptop open and have the you know task light on and whatever and it's not sort of in my face on the on the dining table I think if I didn't have that separate zone I probably wouldn't like it as much um, for me I think I need certainly need the separate space um, but I can certainly see the benefits of actually getting some really productive uh, work done at home and is there anything you'd redesign about your current situation yet um, uh, yes. Maybe it's early to tell. Um, interestingly, the desktop surface that I'm working off is a darker finish, and I don't, I don't love that as much um, for me personally. Um, so I could potentially change that. Um, it's otherwise very practical, though. It's it, from a design point of view, I wouldn't say that it's, um, you know, a fabulous piece of des interior design. That study, it, it's, it's very functional and it works really well. We've got lots of storage, and I think that's important. I can't stand having mess. I am a bit um, uh, sort of psycho like that. I like to have my <laughs> horizontal surfaces clear. So to be able to pull open the drawer and put the papers away if I know people are coming over, I like that. So we've got two banks of drawers, one for myself and one for my husband. He's not very neat, so that's essential to be able to put his stuff away. Um, but yeah, and then we've got like a shelf above. Um, and uh, Angela, the article actually that you sent recently, Angela shared an article around CEOs who are working um, from home and they don't have office environments. One point in there was uh, to have it have some inspirational stuff on the walls or um, photos out. Someone in that article had said that they don't have too many family photos because it would be a distraction for them. But I've actually got a shelf with a whole lot of photos for family and friends and I actually like that because sometimes I'll sit back and I'll be looking at that thinking randomly about something and then, you know, off I go again and sort of a source of inspiration. So it reminds you why you do what you yeah. do, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Adam, where would you spend more time? Apart from the beach. Oh, I'd like to spend more time not working. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Things kind of work quite well in my space, I guess. It's sort of um, the only. If we're going back to, I think for myself, being a product designer, uh, if 
a little bit of a brief for myself would be designing a table that seems to cater for all these things we're talking about. We're, our new place, there's no TV, which is really nice, and sort of the table is the centre kind of focus of sorts, but it's not existing. It's um, an an I bought an antique table, so I'd, there's no drawers or anything like that, but I think I'd really like to di design something, very thin drawers, and if there was an induction charging, it would make things very useful. Actually, yeah, that's, um, I think the charging thing is, and the technology has become more impart, important part of furniture design now, hasn't it? We need our devices attached to us at all times and fully charged and at all times. Definitely at home. The phones always go dead and you're all trying, you know, there's this constant, yeah, I've had a bloody last, you know. Who's got my charger? Got now, yeah. yeah, that's right. Running around trying to mm -hmm. find it. Yeah, the charging thing, I reckon, is key because my iPhone is always depleted on battery. Um, yeah. So I would agree with that. And... Um, when we're designing private resi homes and it hasn't we've never really thought about it in the context of work but all the devices where where do the school notices go the mail i mean we try to be paperless but ultimately people are still receiving some sort of mail um and you know there's usually two or three ipads in a family a few iphones maybe a laptop so um we design a sort of little study nook thing which you'll see up there, the black joinery, um, which with cupboards, pocket doors, so you can then close it away. And I reckon a little drawer in your dining table to, yeah. with the ability to Practical, have... Practical, huh? Yeah. There you go. There's a new idea. You can take it from... <laughs> but yeah, to be able to charge your iPad... And, and fair next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, I reckon would be genius. We'd specify it. So there you go. There you go. All right. Partnership coming up. <laughs> Cool. So what about in terms of the future? Is there, is there anything that you can see happening in terms of emerging trends where um, our homes are being influenced by things going on around in the world in terms of changing the way they're being designed? I think, <coughs> yeah, the technology thing yeah. is massive, which I haven't really had a lot to do with design integrating technology. But, um, yeah, the, I, I think the whole... I don't really like that aesthetic of the technology, so it's trying to integrate technology but still keeping that more friendly sort of language, I think, is the real challenge. So that's why induction's probably better, because you can't notice it, right? It's yeah. all hidden, yeah. I was going to say something, and now it's just escaped my mind. You need coffee. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. <laughs> oh, not a good thing. But um, so what's... what's um, are we seeing health and wellbeing play out, too, at home, in terms of... Um, in terms of design and then trying, you know, we talked a little bit before about those boundaries between work and home and curated choice mm. and curated flexibility. So I know that um, in workplace design that health and wellbeing is huge on the agenda in, in the way that we're talking about things. So are your clients talking to you guys about making sure that um, that's a consideration in, in residential design as well? Um, yeah, I, I guess a little bit. Um but social wealth, social health and well-being as yeah, well, not just the personal. Yeah, I guess it's something that's just, in, I don't know, I feel like those are the types of things that just should be ingrained within a kind of, you know, a good designer. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, be kind of um, on the forefront before, I don't know, I'm always a bit sceptical about the kind of trinkets that kind of go along with those types of things. Um, you know, what do you mean by trinkets? I, I don't know, just, you know, things that are added afterwards, you know, like let's... The tech, the tech, I don't know, I'm quite a little bit old school in that regard. Um, for me, you know, um, integration of technology is really important, but there's also so much that we can still bring to, to the party, I guess, from like old ideas, I suppose. Like face to face and talking to each other. And yeah, 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 and just being close to nature and, you know, like the sense of materiality and things, you know, like I can get deep and kind of meaningful in terms of an architectural perspective, but I, I don't know, they're, they're the things that really matter and they're the things that kind of, I think we connect with as human beings on like a, on, on that, that type of level. Yeah, so we're saying our home design really, the focus is still predominantly around the family, but with the, the physical home environment needs to support other things, but the focus is still our relationships with other people, yeah, right? Correct. Yeah, correct, yeah. 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 Well, and you still need rest and respite, I guess, don't you, yeah. from mm. a busy day? Um, but ultimately, the work environment is going, or your work, your job is going to filter in. So I guess being mindful of how you design the select, your, to your point, Brad, earlier around materiality. I mean, if you are going to design a separate study space, um, you know, our, our Brighton client wanted that really tranquil environment. That was really important for them. So we haven't necessarily had a client specifically say wellness in the home is important to us. But I think generally when we approach a residential project that sort of idea of warmth and comfort is is at the forefront of our mind anyway as a practice 
and and um, I suppose if they're coming to studio tape that's I suppose because part of the appeal is that we do design residential spaces that are inviting and comfortable to be in I think, I think sorry the other thing too for me like from an um, an architectonic uh, point of view is the, the idea of light and the uh, light's such an important thing um, it's really interesting actually so when we moved into our Nightingale apartment I hope Jeremy's not here otherwise I'm in real trouble but um, so basically all the bathrooms were these white palette kind of white on white on white um, and it was all about you know the essentially like most bathrooms in Melbourne and new apartment dwellings are all that don't have a window so it was about kind of incorporating a window but it was also about introducing natural light and for me I don't know when my, myself and my wife when we moved in I don't know out of the, the photos of our office um, come up but um, you know we use a lot of we kind of re return to a lot of dark, a darker palette because we love that kind of um, ambience of light and the transmission of light. So we basically turned our whole bathroom into a black bathroom. So we went completely the opposite, um, which I love because it's sort of like this cave that you go into and this ritual. I think that's the other thing too that I find really interesting is the kind of ritual of going to work and that process. Um, we're, um, we're, we're doing a project at the moment for a couple in Hepburn Springs. Um, really small project, but we just love the nature of the, of, of the clients. And um, she is a graphic designer. She and they had this old shed out the front of their property, and they wanted to actually just insert a little dwelling inside of it. In the end, I, we actually convinced them to put this little dwelling down the hill um, that's just well away from their house and disconnected. Because she, she also kind of was on board with this kind of idea of this ritual of going to work and meandering up the hill. In a funny sort of way, it's, I can kind of relate to that because my meandering is kind of going up a flight of stairs. Um, and I remember when we first moved into Nightingale too, having a conversation with my wife about, you know, she said to me, make sure that you take the stairs every day. You need to do exercise. Otherwise, you're doing three steps a day, you know. Um, so you're creating that journey for people and that, that, that's right, that yeah. break. Yeah. Yeah, that physical break, yeah, the mental break. I think that's something that's super important too, um, is that mental break, um, just to get away from, you know, um, the trials and tribulations of running an architectural practice or whatever you might be doing, or designing a piece of furniture or, you know, just having that break from, um, you know, you're often in that kind of, I find myself in that zone and just need like half an hour just to tune out yep. and do some exercise. Yep. Take the stairs. Yeah, take the stairs. Um, I might just throw to the audience now. Um, does anyone have any questions um, for the panel on anything that's come up today when we talk about this idea of how our homes are changing to suit a new modern lifestyle where work and home and family and everything is all kind of blurred? We do have a handheld mic that I can pass around if anyone's got questions. Um, I just have a question for each of you. Um, so if you're working at home and working in your studio a lot, I'm interested to know um, if you have any activities that you do to switch off because I feel like if I was leaving work and knew that I had a office at home as well, I might find it difficult to um, schedule in my runs or my yoga. Or So I'd just like to know if you have any specific activities you do to switch off from all of it. I'll jump in. I think going like physical activity, as you say, and I suppose making the conscious decision to prioritise it. Um, I'm terrible in winter just getting out. It's freezing and it's dark. Uh, but the other day I left the studio. I didn't have any uh, reason to be there late, so I left at um, five, went and did the walk. I then got back online actually later and was chatting to a few of the guys. From They were all at home themselves, but we were chatting away um, about different things. Um, but I, I, even though I was then working up until about eight-ish and then I had dinner, I was really... I, I didn't, that didn't bother me because I'd actually had the hour walk earlier, you know, at sort of six-ish. So um, I guess for me, the, to, the disconnect and the, to be able to switch off is, um, is definitely physical activity, you know, a walk or a run. I, yeah, I think uh, Adam's probably on the same page, but I used to do a lot of surfing before we had kids. Um, and we live... Yeah, it's backed off a little bit now. Um, but um, I, I guess um, uh, one thing, that, yeah, I, I got to a point of probably six or eight months ago where I was just feeling stir crazy every night. And so, yeah, I took up, um, you know, boxing lessons at a gym, <laughs> um, which has been really good actually, uh, like for, for sort of mental release and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I often find, like, I, I love it sometimes too when the guys just, I'll just sit in the office and the guys will go home and I'll just put music up for half an hour and just tune out a little bit and read a book. 
um, you know, I think um, I've got a quite a big library in the office, and I, I just love immersing myself in that. Getting away from technology, I think that's you know. It's I'm impressed that you can do that guilt-free, knowing that your wife's upstairs with the kids yeah, getting no, dinner just, ready. Yeah, she's not here, luckily. Cat, cat out of the bag now. Yeah, no, no, she's very good actually. She's actually the one who, who actually told me to go surfing more. So um, yeah, she's really supportive that. in that manner. Um, I'm always trying to get the zinc off my face so she doesn't know. <laughs> <clears throat> we um, we have a dog in our office called George, so he's kind of good. I remember I used to find it very irritating and always think, oh, I've got to let George out to go do a wee or something. But now take him to the park and, um, yeah, something kind of to look forward to, to have a trot around the block and decompress a little bit. Yeah, so the dog's been a nice thing. Are there any other questions? Just uh, furthering the discussion about the dining table with the pull-out drawers uh, project that it seems to be pending. Do you think um, the, the productivity uh, around or ideation, uh, the the factory of ideas, is starting to become more potent around a dining environment rather than a boardroom environment, such that you know? friends over with a bottle of wine give you a better outcome than you know, boardroom you know stakeholders taking taking a greater um, play, greater direction or directives yeah I, I definitely think so like I don't know I'm not sure exactly any of my projects have been designed around a dinner party but I would say um, for the way I work, if, when I have a project, I, I don't really um, say, right, I'm going to sit down for four hours now and I'm going to design this project and it's all of a sudden going to happen. It's definitely something um, that I'm you know, working on a number of projects at the same time and I'm thinking about it 24-7 and the idea might come about at any particular time. Um, I, d I don't know if this is exactly answering the question, but it's a much more fluid process. It, it's not a specific process. But then once the idea happens... Um, I definitely need a place to work then to try and sort of realise it, whether it's through drawings or little markets and that kind of thing. Um, but I would feel much more comfortable designing around a table with friends than the corporate kind of environment, yeah. I don't, I don't think I've ever really done that, to be honest, yeah. Yeah, I think it's the nature of context, isn't it? Like, I, I can't imagine myself either being comfortable in that environment, you know. Um, but it is interesting because most of I, our office, I mean, our meeting room table is kind of a glorified dining table in a way um, so there is those, that those parallels I guess it's that, that relatable kind of um, narrative that you know you can that that instead of kind of being forced to, to see things in this kind of corporate zone I, I, which I just don't respond to at all I think I don't know I just with ingrained within me and the way that we approach our work is is always bringing those kind of comforts of home back into the workplace so <clears throat> But I think in talking about maybe what's moving forward, it really is nice now that things are so much more informal, that it, you know, it is mm. a more relaxed environment yep. and you would like to think that breeds a more creative outcome for sure. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, there's a place for both. So there's professionalism combined with, you know, the, quite often you don't see things like the ergonomics or, you know, induction charging or how something's been put together to make it functional, but what you see is the aesthetic. So it's, um, it's kind of making those two things, I guess, happen in tandem so that the ideas can come, but the performance is there as well. Yeah. Um, we find, to your point, just around meetings happening, whether it's a meal, a glass of wine, or, I mean, in, in our studio, sometimes we'll do lunchtime professional development sessions and it, we are sitting, albeit at a laminate table, it's not a beautiful timber dining table in, at home, but, you know, the team are eating lunch and someone's talking about the new, you know, documentation standards that we're adopting or whatever it is. Similar thing, I suppose. It's, it's an informal session. The team are doing lunch and talking work. Um, and, you know, that can foster, you know, different outcomes to, as opposed to if, if we were all just sitting around with a notebook, you know, certain meetings, as you say, and they don't have to have that, you know, super high professional focused feel. Are there any other audience questions? 
Well, I've got one for the panel. What about, um, do you do different work, different types of work at your homework and office work? Does that, does the space influence what you do? Yeah, I think a little bit. Like, definitely answering phone calls and doing emails and that kind of thing happens, integrates into the daily life at home. But if I'm, you know, specifically designing and I need to draw and um, make things, yeah, in the office is where I have all my utensils to do that stuff. So that's definitely a separation. But I've got this romantic dream that I'm going to set up that little sunroom and that'll be an office. I can go for surf and then come back and do a bit of work and go for a surf. (laughs) Yeah, good luck. Uh, Yeah, I'm the same. More admin-based stuff at home and then uh, the more fun, uh, creative stuff with the team in the studio, definitely. Mm. I've tried a couple of times to work from home and it doesn't work. I've usually got a one-year-old hanging off my leg. Um, But I have, um, I I suppose, going back, I suppose it is um, similar to the guys in that it's more administrative type of roles if you can make a telephone call or do some markups or something. But, yeah, I need to be where my stuff is and make models and draw and have charcoal out and all that kind of stuff and, you know, be creative, I suppose, in that environment away from away from home, the dirty place where, you know, and then come home to the clean place. So, uh, if we, we're having kids at home and they're playing with their toys uh, around your legs and that sort of thing, um, is that is that potentially uh, leading to um, a better understanding of human nature to be watching your kids create and make in a home environment? And then does that lead into sort of the, op- the opposing idea of what you're saying, to separate the assembly and making of ideas in a work environment which excludes your kids yeah. to the, the opposition of you? It's a really interesting point, actually, because I had my daughter in the office the other day for the first time when I was making a model because I was telling her about it in the car on the way home from Kinder. And she said, I want to come in and help you. And so she was sitting with me doing it. So, And I often see her too. I've, I mean, a couple of times I've been up on the dining room table just sketching and things, and she's seen me. Um, and then there is that crossover. But it's definitely a, an important one because, um, you know, particularly with our daughter, we want to kind of invest a level of creativity so she can, you know, flourish if she wants to do that. Um, so yeah, there is. There's a really important parallel that I think that you know could go either way. I suppose, um, as to sever or to kind of like influence and um, you know have those things around. It's a really hard one because we're quite. My wife and I are hugely tidy people as well, and since we've had kids, there's stuff everywhere. And I just kind of now I'm just like, oh, we'll just embrace it because they're not that old for you know for a long period of time. But I think it, those things, having things out on the ready, are just provoke creativity um, and hopefully that can lead to them potentially doing something on a creative venture in later in life. Hopefully is not an architect maybe, I don't know. <laughs> not an architect. Is the question as a child what you're surrounded by has the potential to influence where you might end up? Oh well I can speak from personal experience, I mean some of my childhood memories are being um, at display suites on a Saturday because my father has done a number of development projects and now I have worked on designing multi-residential projects. So I think that it can certainly um, influence what where you end up. And, you know, um, we always had architecture books at home and we're always um, exposed to design and architecture as, as kids. I mean, my brother is not in design and architecture, so I guess perhaps I had a predisposition to it. But um, I do think some of those early experiences certainly have shaped where I've ended up today. Yeah. I, think, I think one of the joys that we get as a practice um, doing the educational work is um, a few of the schools that we work for are, are classified as low socioeconomic kind of, um, they're private Catholic schools, but the, there's still things called the breakfast club where there's um, parents who can't afford to um, feed their kids breakfast. Um, so being able to provide a good high level of design for those kids, you know, when they normally they'll never get that, um, and we've seen it firsthand, the kind of the stuff that's happening in the current um, marketplace, I suppose, where, in which we work, is terrible. So in order to give something back um, and create, a, um, I guess, um, a vision, I suppose, for how it, you could enrich someone's life, it's just the most rewarding thing. I think, that's, I think that's one of the things that helps me get up every day and want to really be an architect, you know? I don't do it for kind of 
designing a, a rich person's house, I'd rather much more invest in things like kids, you know, create a rich environment so they can kind of learn and grow up and go, well, this is what good design's about. It's not about necessarily money. It's about, you know, doing things, even from a kind of, um, you know, going back to that thing that I was talking about before about um, using old technologies, you know, like counterweights and all those kind of things. I'll, I think they're still, still really relevant. They can still be really beautiful. Um, all you have to look at, you know, you just look to the 50s and the 60s. and um, So, yeah, it's just trying to bring those things through and um, hopefully better people's lives without trying to, you know, we're not, we're not saving the world, but it's one, one small thing having an impact of some degree, so. Are there any other questions? Okay, look, I might just get the panel before we wind up. Uh, if you were to give the audience just one piece of advice or one thing to consider when designing a home office, either for themselves or for a client, what would you suggest? Yeah, you can go first. Mm. You asked me before if there was something I would change in my working environment, I mentioned the desktop surface. Um, I think, as I said as well, when I was explaining my work environment at home, it's, it is open to the circulation space. So I think for me to have have the door to be able to close it would now that I'm using it more would be key so if space permits I suppose and you're considering designing a work environment um, at home my recommendation would be to ideally have some way of closing it off and if it is just a study nook maybe it's a sliding panel so then you don't feel you need to tidy it up you know all the time and, and therefore it's also not to your point um, the question earlier about disconnecting and having that separation to be able to close it off I think is, is really important. If I had a piece of advice, which I don't like giving out advice, but... Um, We're going to hold you to it? No, but, I, I, you know, I think, I think one thing from, from my perspective would just be, like, you don't have to have heaps of money to, to be able to, you know, create a good space. Um, and that's one... Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the kind of... It's the, it's the natural things. It's the light. It's the orientation. You know, you can sit in a beautiful kind of sunlit spot in a corner um, with a, you know, a, I don't know, a $20 piece of plywood on some trestles. Um, just as well as you can from a, you know, um, you know, a $3,000 piece from wherever it may be. But I'm, and I'm not suggesting that they're bad, bad or good, but I'm just suggesting that, you know, good design doesn't have to come from a place of money necessarily. Um, it's just about somewhere nice for people to be. Yeah. And that's you be. I totally agree. Yeah. Like it's about creating a place where you want to be that feels good to be in. Yeah. A bit of light, whatever it is. A, th a thoughtful place. Lovely. Well, thank you. Thanks, Alex, Brad, Adam. Um, great uh, topic and hopefully some food for thought for the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, thanks for having us.